For over 5,000 years, the Chinese people created a splendid civilization on the land nurtured by the Yellow River and the Yangtze River. During this long period of time, dynasties came and went, and the Chinese culture waxed and waned. Grand and moving stories have played out on the historical stage of China. A hundred and fifty years ago, a specter, the communist specter, appeared in Europe. In the beginning of the 20th century, under the name of the Communist Party, it found a place to stay in China while the national power was deteriorating. Since then, China has faced unprecedented challenges. Everything the CCP has touched has been marred with lies, wars, famine, tyranny, massacre, and terror. Traditional faiths and values have been violently destroyed. Original ethical concepts and social structures have been disintegrated by force. Empathy, love, and harmony have been twisted into struggle and hatred. Veneration and appreciation of heaven and earth have been replaced by an arrogant desire to fight with heaven and earth. This has resulted in a total collapse of social, moral, and ecological systems, and a profound crisis for the Chinese people and the entire mankind. In the 1990s, the former Soviet Union and Eastern European communist regimes fell one after another, and the formerly blossoming appeal of the communist movement wilted. Barely able to maintain its feeble existence, the Communist Party has become impotent. Under its seemingly powerful and prosperous appearance is a tattered and torn picture of its crumbling end. With the collapse just around the corner, China may soon evolve into a society without the CCP. On the eve of the new replacing the old, we must reflect upon this phase of history. What is the Communist Party? How did the Chinese Communist Party begin? What did the Communist Party bring to China and the Chinese people? And how can the Chinese people maintain their traditions and pass them on to later generations? These are the questions that the Chinese people face today. The overturned cart in front is a warning to the carts behind. By reflecting the true history of the CCP, we can help prevent such tragedies from ever recurring. In the process, each of us can also re-examine our inner world. Are there many tragedies that shouldn't have happened, but indeed happened, due to our weakness and compromises? The year 1840, the beginning of China's contemporary era, marked the start of China's journey from tradition to modernization. From then on, Chinese civilization experienced four major episodes of challenge and response. The invasion of Beijing by the Anglo-French Allied Force in the early 1860s, and the desertion of Emperor Xianfeng of the Qing Dynasty, created unprecedented shock to the Chinese people and forced China to respond with the westernization movement. In 1894, the Sino-Japanese War broke out and China was defeated. This caused Chinese people to re-examine the westernization movement, which emphasized imports of modern goods and weapons. People pushed for institutional reforms through the Hundred Days Reform in 1898 and attempted to establish constitutional rule at the end of the late Qing dynasty. In 1904, in order to vie for an advantage in China, a war between Russia and Japan broke out in northeast China. 
The Qing Dynasty declared neutrality over the battle, fought on her own soil, which enraged the populace and intellectuals. Afterwards, China began a more intense transformation and started the Xinhai Revolution in 1911. It overthrew the monarchy and built the Republic of China. In 1918, at the end of the First World War, though China emerged victorious, its benefits were not considered at the Paris Peace Conference by stronger powers at that time, which led to the May 4th Movement. Many Chinese believed that the first three episodes of response had failed. In extreme disappointment and anger, some people chose to follow the path of violent revolution, as had just occurred in Russia. This led to the fourth and last episode of challenge, with the most powerful impact. It has affected China for nearly a century and continues today, the communist movement. Quote, the communists disdain to conceal their views and aims. They openly declare that their ends can be attained only by the forcible overthrow of all existing social conditions." Unquote. This quote is taken from the concluding paragraph of the Communist Manifesto, the Communist Party's principal document. Violence is one of the main means by which the Communist Party gained power. This character trait has been passed on to all subsequent forms of the party that have arisen since its birth. The world's first communist party was established many years after Karl Marx's death. This party grew out of the use of violence against so-called class enemies and was maintained through violence against party members and ordinary citizens. According to statistics, during Stalin's purges in the 1930s, the Communist Party of the Soviet Union slaughtered over 20 million so-called spies, traitors, and those thought to have different opinions. As a branch of the Third Communist International, which was controlled by the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, the CCP naturally inherited the willingness to kill. In August 1927, when the Beiyang warlords had just been overthrown by the nationalist government and China was soon to be unified, the CCP initiated an armed rebellion in Nanchang, Jiangxi province and established the Chinese Soviet. During the so-called civil war between the nationalists and communists, from 1927 to 1936, the population in Jiangxi province dropped from over 20 million to only about 10 million. The damage wrought by the CCP's use of violence can be seen from these figures alone. Using violence may be unavoidable when attempting to gain political power, but there has never been a regime as eager to kill as the CCP especially during otherwise peaceful periods. According to statistical data in The Black Book of Communism, published in 1997 in France, the entire communist movement caused 100 million deaths. Among them, China's death toll was 65 million, a number that surpasses the total casualties of World War I and World War II and the total casualties of all previous Chinese dynasties. Uh. An excellent example of the Communist Party's use of violence to the people is its support of the Cambodian Khmer Rouge. After it captured political power in 1975, it unexpectedly murdered a quarter of Cambodia's population, including a majority of Chinese immigrants and descendants. China still blocks the international community from putting the Khmer Rouge on trial so as to cover up the CCP's notorious role in the genocide.
No wonder people say, other political groups slaughter in order to conquer, the Communist Party conquers in order to slaughter. One of the theories the Communists employ is social Darwinism. In 1859, based on his observations, Charles Darwin proposed his theory to attempt to explain the origin of man. Due to the lack of evidence, his theory was unceasingly challenged and doubted in the scientific circles. The Communist Party, however, treats it as a scientific law and takes it absolutely. They even applied species competition to human society, maintaining that class struggle is the only driving force for societal development. Struggle, therefore, became the primary belief of the Communist Party, a tool in gaining political control and means to survive. Mao's famous words plainly reveal the logic of survival of the fittest. With 800 million people, he said, how can it work without struggle? Another one of Mao's claims that contains similar survival logic is that the Cultural Revolution should be conducted every seven or eight years. The repetitive use of force is an important means for the CCP to maintain its rule in China. The goal of using force is to create terror. Every struggle and movement served as an exercise in terror so that the Chinese people trembled in their hearts, submitted to the terror, and gradually became enslaved under terror. This crazy sentence, shouted by Wang Chao Shu, a character in a movie about the tragic time of the Cultural Revolution, has been like a haunting ghost, echoing in the minds of the Chinese people. Today, in the 21st century, terrorism has become the main enemy of the civilized and free world. The CCP's exercise of violent terrorism, thanks to the apparatus of the state, has been larger in scale, much longer lasting, and its results more devastating. In Chinese society today, the saying, taking the class struggle as the key link, is no longer mentioned. But in the business world, any and all means are resorted to in competition. The party has used China's so-called special characteristics and the right to subsistence as excuses to deny basic human rights. Isn't this a mutation of the struggle philosophy of survival of the fittest? The level of civilization can be measured by the degree to which violence is used in a regime. By resorting to the use of violence, the communist regimes clearly represent a huge step backward in human civilization. Unfortunately, the communist party has been seen as progressive by those who believe that violence is an essential and inevitable means to societal advancement. This acceptance of violence has to be viewed as an unrivaled and skillful employment of deception and lies by the Communist Party. This is another trait inherited by the CCP. On July 4, 1947, the CCP official newspaper, Xinhua Daily, published this editorial, quote, Since a young age, we have thought of the United States as a lovable country. We believe this is partly due to the fact that the United States has never occupied China, nor has it launched any attacks on China. More fundamentally, the Chinese people hold good impressions of the United States based on the democratic and open-minded character of its people." Unquote. At that time, the CCP, 
besieged in Yan'an, was trying hard to win favorable impressions from America and to receive military aid. A mere three years later, the CCP sent soldiers to fight American troops in North Korea and painted the Americans as the most evil imperialists in the world. To this day, this CCP editorial and other similar publications are still banned in mainland China. The reason is that the CCP does not want its deception and lies to be exposed. In 1957, the CCP called on the intellectuals to offer their opinions to help rectify the Communist Party. On June 8th, the People's Daily published an editorial. It was called, Why is This? Taking this as a turning point, the rectification movement suddenly transformed into an anti-rightist campaign. When some criticized the persecution as a conspiracy or a plot in the dark, Mao claimed publicly, this is not a plot in the dark, but a stratagem in the open. This is a part of the speech by Zhang Qing, the first vice director of the Central Leading Committee for the Great Cultural Revolution, recorded in the initial period of the Great Cultural Revolution. Soon, the president of China, Liu Xiaoqi, was taken as a rebel and a traitor from within and a scab. That's what he was called and forever he was expelled from the party. Remarkably, 10 years later, Liu Xiaoqi was announced at the rehabilitation as a great proletarian revolutionist, great communist soldier, and great Marxist-Leninist. Details of his persecution is still a forbidden area of research. Since coming to power, the CCP has employed similar strategies in every single movement. From the three antis and five antis to the Cultural Revolution, and from the Tiananmen Square Massacre to the persecution of Falun Gong. Deception and lies go hand in hand with violence. Deception and lies serve to justify and mask the rule by violence. When violence becomes too weak to sustain control, the CCP resorts to deception and lies. Chinese intellectuals have had the greatest faith in history since ancient times. China enjoys the longest and most complete history in the world, and the Chinese people have used history to assess current reality and even to achieve personal spiritual improvement. To make history serve the current regime, the CCP has made a practice of altering and concealing historical truth. Concealing, altering, and rewriting history, whether it be in the divisions of time, in the assessment of historical figures, or in the accounts of historical events, such historical alterations have continued for more than 50 years since 1949. And all efforts to restore historical truth have been ruthlessly blocked and eliminated by the CCP. Every person from China who goes overseas feels shocked when seeing how the international society explains the historical events of the Northern Expedition, the Sino-Japanese War, the Korean War, and others. A Western proverb states that the truth never changes while a lie must be constantly retold. This statement really makes clear a general principle. During its 80-year history and its 16 national conventions for the party representatives, the CCP even revised its party constitution 16 times. The guiding theories of the CCP started with Marxism-Leninism, Maoism was added, and then Deng's thoughts and recently Zhang's three represents have been added. Marxism-Leninism and Maoism 
are not at all compatible with Deng's theories and Zhang's ideology. They are actually opposite to them. This hodgepodge of communist theories employed by the CCP is indeed a rarity in human history. The Communist Party's evolving principles have largely contradicted one another. The Communist Party has never had a motherland. Their earliest slogan was World Commonwealth, using communism to unify the world. Today, however, communist China has become a case of extreme nationalism. The Communist Party originally emphasized social classes, eliminating all private ownership and all exploitative classes. Today, the CCP promotes capitalists to join the party. The present China has the most severe polarization between the rich and the poor in the world. Many CCP members have become filthy rich, while the country has 800 million living in poverty. The CCP even allowed capitalists to join the party and wrote this into the Communist Party Constitution. Yesterday's principles have become reversed in today's politics, with further change expected tomorrow. For example, whether it be collaboration with the KMT, the Nationalist Party, having a pro-US foreign policy, promoting nationalism, or having a cycle of suppression and subsequent rehabilitation, each of these decisions occurred at a moment of crisis. In the history of the CCP, there have been more than a dozen movements that are life and death struggles. In reality, all of these struggles have coincided with the transfer of power following changes of the basic party principles. Every change has come from an inevitable crisis faced by the CCP, threatening its legitimacy and survival. Every goal is for capturing and maintaining power as well as enjoying monopoly over social rights. The CCP promised land to the peasants, factories to the workers, freedom and democracy to the intellectuals, and peace to all. None of these promises has ever been realized. One generation of Chinese died deceived, and another generation continues to be cheated. Societies other than communist regimes, even those suffering under rigid totalitarian rule and dictatorship, often allow some degree of self-organization and self-determination. Ancient Chinese society was, in fact, ruled according to a binary structure. In rural regions, clans were the center of an independent social organization while urban areas were organized around the guild. The top-down government did not extend below the county level. Even the Nazi regime during World War II still allowed rights to private property. Only communist regimes eradicated any form of social organization or elements independent of the party replacing them with highly centralized power structures from the top down. If the former social structures conform to nature, then the communist regime is anti-nature in its essence. Since the inception of the CCP, three basic lines have been established. They are the political line, the ideological line, and the organizational line. The entire content of the so-called organizational line is that all CCP members and those ruled by the CCP are to obey party commands unconditionally. In China, most know about the dual personalities of CCP members. In private settings, CCP members are ordinary human beings with feelings of happiness, anger, sorrow, and joy. They possess ordinary human beings' merits and shortcomings. 
They may be parents, husbands, wives, or friends. But placed above human nature and feelings is the party nature, which always transcends humanity. Thus, the concepts of good and evil, as well as all laws and rules, are arbitrarily manipulated. Murder is not allowed, except for those categorized as enemies by the Communist Party. Respecting one's elders is welcomed, except in the case of parents of those who have been deemed class enemies. All Chinese people are protected by the Constitution, except for Falun Gong members. Benevolence, justice, courtesy, wisdom, and sincerity are all good, but not applicable when the party is not willing or doesn't want to consider these traditional virtues. The Communist Party completely overthrows universal human nature and social standards, and builds itself on principles that oppose human nature and social standards. They completely overthrow the superstructure of the old society. During the Cultural Revolution, it was all too common that fathers and sons tortured each other. Husbands and wives struggled with each other. Mothers and daughters reported on each other. And students and teachers treated each other as enemies. Party nature motivated the conflicts and hatred in these cases. The plot of the Beijing opera, Farewell My Concubine, gives a vivid description of how the Chinese Communist Party warps human nature. What needs to be pointed out is that such absolute obedience to the party nature results from the CCP's prolonged course of indoctrination. This training starts in preschools and kindergartens, where party-sanctioned answers to questions are rewarded, answers that do not comply with common sense or with a child's human nature, are rewarded. Students receive political education when they attend primary school and middle school and all the way to college, and they learn to follow party-sanctioned standard answers. Otherwise, they are not allowed to pass the exams and graduate. Today, the CCP has completely degenerated into a political entity struggling to maintain self-interest. It no longer pursues any of the lofty goals of communism. However, the organizational structure of communism remains, and its demand for unconditional conformity has not changed. A party member must remain consistent with the party line when speaking publicly, no matter how he feels privately. The organizational structure of the CCP is a gigantic pyramid with the central power on top controlling the entire hierarchy. This party, situating itself above humanity and human nature, removes any organizations or persons deemed detrimental or potentially detrimental to its own power, be they ordinary citizens or high-ranking CCP officials. The Chinese traditionally believe in the unity of heaven and human beings. Lao Tzu said, Man follows the earth, the earth follows heaven, heaven follows the Tao, and the Tao follows what is natural. Human beings and nature exist within a harmonious relationship in the continuous cosmos. The Communist Party does not believe in God, nor does it even respect physical nature. The notorious saying of the CCP was, battle with heaven, fight with the earth, struggle with humans, therein lies endless joy. In this context, the so-called elimination of private ownership, 
turned out to be looting and plundering everyone's properties, while the so-called public ownership became the communist oligopoly's ownership. Religious beliefs are forcibly cracked down upon and absolutely prohibited, and in the meantime, humanity and human rights are suppressed and trampled. Religious beliefs were replaced with belief in communism's promise of a harmonious society and its rule by the deified Communist Party. The promise of a harmonious society was entirely fabricated to deceive the people. Communism transformed from a false theory into an evil practice, and the Communist Party that implemented the practice thus became an evil specter that opposes mankind, earth, heaven, nature, and the cosmos. In China, nobody has ever seen fiscal budgets for the CCP's organizations, only fiscal budgets for the state, local governments, and enterprises. But in the people's daily learning, work, family lives, social activities, and almost all information sources, the CCP actually extends everywhere and controls everything. From the central government to the village committees in rural areas, the municipal officials are always ranked lower than the communist cadres. So, municipal governments have to follow instructions from the Communist Party committees at the same level. The expenses of the party are paid by the administrative units, yet they are not budgeted separately. The organization of the CCP, like a giant evil-possessing spirit, attaches to every single unit and cell of the Chinese society, as tightly as a shadow following an object. It penetrates deeply into every capillary and cell of society with its finest blood-sucking vessels and thereby controls and manipulates society. For this reason, Chinese farmers live in such poverty and drudgery. They not only have to support their traditional administrative officials, but also as many or even more communist cadres. For this reason, Chinese workers lost their employment in vast numbers. The omnipresent, blood-sucking vessels of the possessing CCP have been extracting funds from their factories for many years. For this reason, Chinese intellectuals find it so difficult to gain intellectual freedom. In addition to their administrators, there are CCP shadows lingering everywhere, doing nothing but monitoring them. In the book, Communist Manifesto, The Founding Principles of the Communist Party, Marx proclaimed that, in 1848, a specter is haunting Europe, the specter of communism. Over a century later, communism is more than a haunting specter. It has possessed a concrete, material body. It spread around the world like an epidemic. It killed tens of millions and took away property and the free mind and spirit of hundreds of millions. The CCP, an evil-possessing specter supported by force, deception, and the frequent change of its appearance and images, now shows signs of decay, nervous at every slight disturbance. It attempts to survive by accumulating more wealth and tightening control but these actions only serve to intensify the crisis. It may repeat its intrigues from the past with some sort of retreat, for instance, redressing the Tiananmen Square Massacre or Falun Gong, or expelling a small number of people as the enemy. Nevertheless, 
it cannot change its intrinsic evil nature. Facing challenges over the past 100 years, the Chinese nation has responded by importing weapons, reforming its systems, and enacting extreme and violent revolutions. Countless lives have been lost, and most Chinese traditional culture has been abandoned. It appears that the responses have failed. When agitation and anxiety occupied the Chinese mind, an evil specter took the opportunity to enter the scene and eventually controlled this last surviving ancient civilization in the world. In future crises, the Chinese people will inevitably have to choose a game. No matter how the choice is made, every Chinese must understand that any lingering hope in the CCP will only worsen the damage done to the Chinese nation and inject new energy into this evil-possessing specter. We must abandon all illusions, examine ourselves thoroughly without the influence of hatred, greed, or desire. Only then can we rid ourselves of the nightmarish control that the possessing spirit of the CCP has had over the last 50 years. In the name of a free nation, the Chinese civilization can be re-established based on respect for human nature and compassion for all.